Members, there have been some changes to normal practice in order to support the new hybrid arrangements. Timings of debates have been amended to allow technical arrangements to be made for the next debate. There will also be suspensions between each debate. I remind members participating physically and virtually that they must arrive for the start of debates in Westminster Hall and members are expected to remain for the entire debate. I must also remind members participating virtually they are visible at all times, both to each other and to us in the booth rod room. If members attending virtually have any technical problems, they should email the Westminster Hall clerk's email address. And members attending physically should clean their spaces before they use them and as they leave the room. We now have Tom Hunt to move the motion. Mr Hunt. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. Um, I beg to move that this House has considered e-petitions 564, 696, 548, 778, 573, 61 and 564, 209. Um, first one um, is to do with cancelling GCSE and A-levels level, A in 2021 to replace of coursework and teacher assessment. That's created in 29th December. Um, the second one is to allow teacher predicted grades for BTEC students. The third one is to keep schools closed until May. And then the fourth one is to close schools in all tier four areas. So four petitions in total. And clearly, um, over the last uh, four or five months, the situation has been incredibly fluid. So clearly, um, some of these petitions, two in particular, um, circumstances of kind of and events have moved ahead of them slightly. Um, however, I do think this is a very valuable opportunity to have a discussion about the impact of COVID-19 on our children's education in a more general sense. I mean, you couldn't get much of a broader debate, uh, and I imagine myself and colleagues will find it very difficult uh, to keep our points concise because this is such a uh, uh, multifaceted issue, and our, child uh, our children have been impacted in so many different ways by COVID-19, but I will attempt to do so, and I'm just going to cover upon um, four or five key lessons that I think we need to take away from this and some, um, and some thoughts that I, I have. And the first one is to do with the danger of making generalisations and also uh, making assumptions about how a child may or may not have found schools being closed, particularly uh, based on, say, the socioeconomic background they may come from. There is some uh, evidence produced by Sutton Trust that would suggest that children from more deprived backgrounds have been particularly badly impacted by the closure of schools compared with children from other areas, but we should not necessarily assume that. And we should not assume that because a child, say, um, was in a different situation, that they found it any easier. Because I, you know, I, I, I've, I've spoken to a number of families whose children uh, have come from a variety of different backgrounds and for whatever reason have found it particularly difficult and their mental health has been particularly impacted and in coming to those sort of generalizations we should not lose those individual stories because in some senses no one child's experience of the past year has been the same and our, we need a response that as far as possible does cater for that individual child wherever possible so that's the first point i wanted to make um, secondly is just in, in regards to mental health um, we had a uh, so, uh, research published by Mind that said that 73% of school, those at school had felt as though their mental health had deteriorated over the past year. There is a massive challenge in front of the government, there's a massive challenge in front of schools, there's a massive challenge in front of young people to try and uh, to make up for some of the learning loss that has clearly been and happened over the last year. But another point that I would make is I think we should be careful in the language that we use. There is a big challenge in front of us. But I think we should be aware that the anxiety that many young people feel at the moment is already very significant. So sometimes the words that I see in the media, like lost generation and, uh, and all of this, I mean, sometimes it, it can just fuel those anxieties to an even greater extent. So yes, there is a significant challenge in front of us, but we can overcome it. So I think in a sense, a degree of positivity and a can-do spirit, because my concern is, um, a daunting situation may become even more daunting if we're not careful in the language that we use. Um, the Minister will be aware from my position on the Education Select Committee that I do speak 
very uh, frequently about special educational needs. And one of the things, there is, you know, most of the meetings we have, the National Send Review, it, it, it has been delayed. But I think if there can be an advantage from this delay, it is that it allows us to properly look at the way in which this pandemic has had a unique or, or a slightly it could, or a different impact on different children, and, and that includes those with special ed educational needs. And it must include, yes, those with EHCP plans, but it must incl include those who might not have one of those plans, but still have learning disabilities. And you know, dyslexic and dyspraxic pupils would be the, the sort of the, um, two examples of that, um, because they haven't been eligible to come into school most recently, for example. They haven't been able to come into school. And, some of those individuals have struggled with online learning and uh, because of the unique way in which many of them learn, not having that personal engagement has often made it much more difficult for them to learn and some, I fear, have fallen behind more as a result of that. When we talk about those with perhaps more complex and significant needs and disabilities, something else that we need to bear in mind is their mental state uh, and, and often how they struggle with transitions. So the movement from working online to back into school to online and then back into school can have a profound impact on their mental state. Many of them have been eligible to still keep on coming into school, but many haven't. And there's often been good reasons for that. So I think that kind of therapeutic approach to help them with a the transition from what might seem like quite an unsettling period for them is also very important. I, I, I am encouraged by what I've heard about the tutoring programme and how when we think about the ways in which our young people can catch up from any learning loss, that there have been some SEN specialists have been feeding into that. That was encouraging, but I think that it would be brilliant if today I could hear more about how that's working in practice. I mean, the next point is to do with exams, and one of the petitions here calls, called for a cancellation of exams. I think in the bearing in mind the circumstances, I don't think there is any alternative. I think it was the right decision to cancel those exams, but I also believe that it was a regrettable decision. I think it was a decision, I think we were left with no choice, but that doesn't mean that I think it, you know, it, it, it comes with its own negatives. I do believe that exams should be here to stay. I don't think that this should be used as an opportunity to question the role of exams in the medium to long term. I believe that they continue to be the fairest way often of assessing pupils. And I think we should also think about those young people who actually quite like exams and exams quite often quite they work for them uh, and often uh, a lot of those children actually tend to have often have learning disabilities um, and I talk as somebody who um, you know who had who has dyspraxia and has dyslexia um, and when I was a 12 year old had a reading writing age of an eight year old ended up catching up and did have my struggles throughout school but I actually used to quite like exams because I was an unconventional learner I didn't do well in the classroom. I didn't go at the same pace as everybody else. That revision gave me time to consolidate my knowledge and surprise my exams. And, what, and I really would not wanted to have been at school over the last year. So I think we should think about, um, about how those children and, and they, they could feel as though their chance to flourish has been taken away. I, in, in terms of the, um, the, you know, the teacher assessments we're gonna have, uh, this year, um, I, there will be some schools that have not these tests, you know, which will feed into the overall assessment. But these tests are not mandatory. Perhaps I think they should have been mandatory. Um, and, and I'll also say that um, having um, spoken uh, to the Minister about this before, my understanding is that um, the, te uh, the teachers at a school will have a degree of flexibility over this. And my understanding is that not necessarily all of the children, um, the approach will have to be exactly the same. So it might be that some children in the school can take a test and others don't. Um, I'd also like to think that those pupils could feed into the process and if they felt that they would, by having a test, that would mean that their teachers can come to, a, are in a better place to make an accurate assessment about their progress, then I think their views should be taken into account. And I go back to the point I made about dyslexic pupils and I've spoken to two uh, head teachers at dyslexic schools where all of the pupils are dyslexic and it is interesting that both of those schools have taken a decision to have tests for all pupils and I think that, that, that that's useful in, in, in providing some a sense as to how it may be in all of those children who could be negatively impacted by this. 
I, I, another point I would like to make is children who have English as a second language. Um, I know that um, in my own constituency there is um, um, there, there are many many um, pupils who come under that who come under that bracket, and I, and I have spoken to head teachers in my own constituency who are concerned that the level of participation uh, in some of the online learning has been less in those communities, and also that their, that their English has actually gone backwards throughout throughout the time that schools have been closed. So I think when we're thinking about catch up, that needs to be there needs to be that, that aspect needs to be there also. Um, so, and I was encouraged from a meeting that the Education Select Committee had recently with um, the catch-up commissioner, um, because I've had a number of conversations with head teachers in my constituency recently who said that when, it, when, we talk, when we're thinking about catch-up, there needs to be flexibility at the heart of it, and actually teachers and head teachers who know their children better than anybody else, they should be, well, they should be able to take the decisions that they believe to be in the best interests of each individual child, and that was something that the catch-up commissioner made very clear that that will be the case. Because there's lots of things we're going to have to work out, particularly with um, sort of catch-up schools over the summer, how they're going to interrelate with the holiday food and activity programmes, how are they going to relate to each other, and how is that going to, how is that going to work. Um, so I think having that, you know, that flexibility with, with catch-up, so the teacher and the head teacher can make those decisions, because it goes back to what I said earlier. You know, we shouldn't make assumptions about how each child has found lockdown because this, this idea that, you know, and, and there, is, there is an element of truth that it, clearly if you, if you live in, if your home environment, some home environments are more conducive to online learning than other environments. There's a reality there. If you don't have your own bedroom, you don't have a quiet place you can work, um, you, you might have parents who want to help but frankly can't help you as much as they'd like to with your learning. Uh, and, or you might live in a different background where you do have your own space, you do have parents who are able to help you. But we shouldn't assume that, because sometimes we might have uh, parents who might be able to help but can't, because they're working around the clock. We don't know what their circumstances are going to be. So I, I think my, in a nutshell, in summary, I think my key points that I'd like to make are we shouldn't generalise, we shouldn't make assumptions. We, as far as possible, we should approach each individual young person and try and cater for their own needs. And secondly, unsurprisingly, special educational needs and the different ways in which it's impacted them. Because as I, as I said before, it is so important we get SEND right. It's right morally, it's right for them, but it's also necessary for our country because we don't want to lose their talents. Mm -hmm. And this, this, this pan pandemic in some ways has made a situation harder for them. And we should also think about those children who perhaps this way we've been assessing has worked against them and they've been a loser in that. So I think when we're thinking about how COVID has impacted our young people, we need to be sensitive in the language we use also and conscious of the way in which it's been their learning but also their mental health that has suffered. It is going to be difficult, it is going to be difficult to catch up but there are children and we will do whatever we take to support them so it, there needs to be a degree of positivity there as well. Thank you very much. The question is that this House has considered e-petitions 564696, 548778, 573621 and 564209 relating to the impact of COVID-19 on education. Sarah Olney. Thank you very much, Mr. Robertson. It's a, a pleasure to uh, attend this debate under your chairmanship, and I really do value the opportunity to contribute to uh, the, it, all of the uh, issues raised by these petitions, but also the wider issues for our education sector as a result of COVID-19. I'd like really to start by paying tribute to all of the teaching staff, school staff, parents, and especially the children uh, attending schools across my constituency in Kingston and in Richmond uh, for the successful way that they've all returned to school last week. Um, I was speaking uh, this just this morning to the head of the education service for both boroughs and he was
was telling me that it's all gone extremely smoothly. I've also had an opportunity to speak to teachers uh, from all sorts of schools across the constituency. The, uh, the testing in our secondary schools has gone very, very well. Most children, my own included, are absolutely thrilled to be back at school and back with their friends. It's all gone extremely well. And it's a huge tribute to, as I say, staff, parents and children across the constituency. But also, I just want to say a huge thank you to all the parents who picked up on that homeschooling over the last incredibly difficult few months. Um, they've done a wonderful job um, and they can all pat themselves on the back because successfully having delivered their children back to school is where we all want to see them. I'd like to start really by asking uh, the Minister for a bit of clarity on the issue of face masks in secondary school um, and particularly what the science is saying about the benefits of wearing a face mask and in reducing transmission versus the disadvantages it creates for communication. I was very lucky to have a, a Zoom chat with some uh, year 11 students at Christ School in Richmond last Wednesday and it was wonderful to see them in their classroom but it was it was strange to see them with their face masks so I really would value some clarity from the DfE about the value of wearing face masks. I also want to ask about uh, the issue of exams which obviously the member for Ipswich has raised uh, with, with uh, you know a great deal of, uh, of, of in, uh, interesting insight perhaps into his own experience. Um, there's still a great deal of uncertainty about how qualifications are going to be awarded this year. And I'm very concerned that that lack of standardization across exam centers will negatively affect some, uh, some students who may well have delivered uh, better results or achieve better results if they've been able to sit their exams. And I really would welcome a little bit more clarification on that. I think it's, I think it's a pity that it's taken until now, really, for, for any kind of guidance at all to be issued, given that the, the probable need to cancel exams was identified uh, quite some time ago. The schools I've spoken to are very concerned about the appeals process uh, and to the extent to which that's going to create uh, an additional burden for schools. I have no doubt that there will be many uh, parents and students who will want to appeal the, uh, the mark that they're given and I am very concerned that that will create a lot of a big burden for schools at the end of August just as they're preparing for the new school year and I would really welcome some more guidance from the DfE about how they're planning to address that particular topic. Um, but I think the biggest barrier, the biggest um, issue that most of the schools in my constituency are currently facing is the issue of funding. There's been a massive increase in the pressure on school budgets due to COVID. Obviously, there are increased costs due to all of the COVID secure measures that our schools have needed to take uh, as a result of welcoming children back into school, both now and obviously uh, back in September. And many of them are reporting a, a hit to their income from being unable to hire out their facilities and other uh, um, uh, you know, uh, things that they might have been able to do, sports clubs and so on and so forth. But schools are not seeing an increase in their budgets that they need to meet those costs and not being compensated for the additional uh, expense. And that's a real, real worry for some of them. There have been other hits to their income from, um, from some of the grants they would normally get have not been made available. Um, and also, in addition to that, local authorities have not been given the guidance they need as to to what extent they can uh, assist schools to uh, you know that are in financial difficulty from funds that they have available. Um, there is not there's not been clarity uh, to, as to the extent to which uh, local authorities can assist schools in dif uh, in difficulty. And I'd just like to to end perhaps I, again by echoing a point made by the, the member for Ipswich in his opening remarks. It's so important that schools can respond to their individual pupils' needs at this time. Uh, I think he's absolutely right about some of the language that we're using. And I think from my own experience as a parent, but also speaking to schools and constituencies that what children have really missed is the group activities they would normally be doing. Um, and what I'd really call for as we talk about catch up and we talk about addressing some of the problems that lockdown has caused to school children, what I really want to see is that extra funding going to schools directly to address those issues and not perhaps being given maybe to outsource private practitioners. And, and that's the thing that I think will really, really help our students as they come back to school, which is obviously what we're all so uh, happy to see. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Ben Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship and to speak in this debate, uh, covering a number of petitions about both the return to school and about this year's assessments. Obviously, the impact of COVID on our schools and therefore on our children and young people has been huge. I would argue that perhaps it's still been underestimated. And I've, I've said before in this space that I wouldn't personally have closed schools. I think the impact on over a thousand children in Nottinghamshire, that's just the county excluding the city, so the number may be twice as high as that 
who are known to children's services for one reason or another, vulnerable children who have been out of school for months and months is huge. We saw a spike in referrals for uh, abuse and to children's services following last summer's lockdown. And I have no doubt we'll be seeing the same again now. We owe it to those children in particular to put them at the heart of our plans for recovery. It's not all uh, just about the most vulnerable children, though, Mr Chairman. This is impacted on all children. I'm lucky enough to be a father of two primary boys. I'm, I'm sorry, lucky enough. Mr Bradley, I'm terribly sorry to interrupt. Your, your voice is not coming through very clearly. I wonder if you could uh, try and either speak a little more loudly or a little bit more closer to the microphone. I'm sorry to interrupt. I'll, my, I'll hold the, the microphone right uh, close to my face. Mr. Uh, that's, that's, better. Uh, that's better. Thank you. Um, so uh, it's, it's not just vulnerable children, uh, Mr Chairman, that have been impacted uh, by these lockdowns. I'm lucky enough to be father of two primary age boys, uh, and they are lucky enough to have been able to mostly continue to attend school uh, as my wife has been working on the supermarket shop floor throughout. But even they have missed their social lives. They've missed out on a lot of experiences. They've seen both their education and development impacted. But this time uh, in the lives of our children and young people is hugely important, whether it's early development as a primary school student, mastering the academic basics, but learning to make friends, to understand the school environment, how to act around other people, or as a teenager studying for major qualifications whilst also kind of coming out of your shell, becoming an adult, finding yourself. How much more difficult must it be to begin to find your independence and your own self separate from your parents when you're forced to spend every day at home with them and you don't get to go and do anything else? In terms of what do we, we do about it, uh, and this is the key, isn't it, going forward, I mean, government's talked a lot about academic catch-up and tutoring, which is welcome. But the biggest challenge that both parents and teachers have raised uh, with me is a social one, not an academic one. The teachers have told me uh, that children effectively uh, have kind of been forgetting what it means to be in school, how to act, how to behave, and, and having to relearn all of that having changed those behaviours uh, as they're not used to being around groups of people or seeing their friends or being in the classroom. They're having kind of shrunk back into their shells, having spent time uh, on their own, and it's a challenge now to draw them out again. To me, that means we need to focus not just on academia, but on the social side of things. We should offer more support to extracurricular activities, uh, including sport. Let's not forget the health and fitness impact of all this too, and the inequalities that will only have grown as a result of lockdown and the inactivity that came with it. We could start by looking seriously at how we can open up uh, our sports facilities. 40% of our nation's sports facilities remain locked behind school gates at evenings and weekends. We have to focus on transitioning children back into the classroom where they need it and supporting teachers to do that. Those children moving to secondary school this year, for example, have missed so much of the transitional process that they normally would get. A government could promote and support things like at nurture provision at both primary and secondary level to help children to adapt and ease into school life at their own pace rather than being chucked in at the deep end. Uh, I hope government will be able to support schools deliver some of that year seven transition uh, as much as possible before the end of this year. Um, a few years ago, the then Health Secretary, the Right Honourable Member for South West Surrey, launched a programme of introducing and expanding mental health support into schools. I've spoken with the schools minister about this uh, recently. I wonder if he could update the House on any discussions about whether this plan, which at the time seemed to be wide ranging and very positive, is now considered to still be adequate or whether we can speed that up and extend it in the light of the struggles that many will face as a result of the pandemic. On the issue of academia, I think the PM's proposals for one-to-one -one tutoring could be great if they can be done uh, logistically, if they are possible, uh, as an addition to the social support that's needed. It will be important to work across schools, colleges and universities to ensure there's a recognition of the challenges that young people have faced and the difference between grades given this year compared to other years, because clearly uh, nobody should be disadvantaged as they seek to move on to the next stage of their lives. I do think all of this calls into question some of what we do around our assessments. I'm uh, no detractor from, from testing at all. I think it's important, but we saw the major challenges faced as a result of so much of our assessment being built solely on those exams at the end of the year. And in the absence of those, there have been all sorts of problems. Obviously, other countries have different systems. Some have an ongoing system of teacher-led assessment as a matter of course. And I wonder how the minister feels those countries might have compared in terms of the challenges of, of assessment through this period. Uh, I particularly question whether there's really a need to formally assess year two students, for example, or whether in fact, uh, just generally, frankly, but also in the light of COVID, we should be more willing to trust our teachers and to rely on their ongoing assessment as to what children in their care need. Um, they are better placed to assess the ability and the support needed by children at that young age than an exam paper is, in my view, and particularly if the needs of those children at four, five, six years old uh, are more, um, uh, you know, more social uh, as opposed to academic. Um, it might be that that is something we could look at. 
the knowledge that teachers have, the knowledge of their students and what they need will be more important than ever as we seek to recover from the pandemic. I think uh, across the board, both teachers and students would benefit from having that trust in their relationship within school to help support children. There are lessons to take from, from online learning too. And while some have struggled, others have loved it and have excelled, uh, have attended where they might not have done before. There may be a role for using remote learning permanently in some instances. My uh, local college reported uh, excellent attendance uh, amongst some of the students who hadn't really engaged before, people who hadn't been showing up. They reported excellent um, work and excellent um, uh, kind of progress for a lot of students with autism, for example, who might have struggled in a, a classroom environment but found online learning to be uh, really positive. So um, perhaps particularly post-16, perhaps also with SEM pupils, but we should review across the board how remote learning could benefit uh, young people. I know that's part of the Prime Minister's plan in terms of um, uh, indep independent uh, and individual tutoring as well. Uh, and finally, Mr Chairman, I'll, I'll wrap up. I wanted to just touch on skills. I welcome the government's FE white paper, which I think was some uh, excellent proposals on, on boosting and supporting further education. The Minister knows my view that many children will benefit from, from more access to technical and vocational education as part of their curriculum within school or being allowed out to college um, earlier on in their, their school life which I've always felt is an opportunity for the 18% the uh, currently who leave school with no qualifications at all to do something different, to fall in love with education um, through learning in a way that's directly linked to the world of work or to things that they enjoy. Given the impacts of so many children who have been out of education so long and the challenge of getting them back into the classroom and being comfortable in the classroom again, I hope the Minister will give real consideration to how this might work both as a chance to get young people back into learning after COVID, but also to complement the FE reforms that have been brought forward by government and to help uh, to get the most out of uh, education for all of our young people in the long term, including those 18% who previously uh, haven't managed to get those qualifications from traditional schooling. Uh, with that, Mr Chairman, I'll wrap up. But uh, just finish by saying that this is hugely important and we owe it as I started uh, my, my speech. We owe it to um, all of our young people and our children to put them at the heart of our recovery plans. Uh, ultimately, they are the ones who are going to have to deal with this for the longest, for the future of our country, our economy, uh, and for all of us going forward. And they should absolutely be front of and center of every decision we make as we look to recover from this pandemic. Thank you. We now go to Strangford, Jim Shannon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a pleasure to speak on this issue. Uh, and. Uh, uh, to discuss uh, the education and COVID-19. The damage long-term to our children in terms of their education and social skills is something which I have been incredibly concerned about. And indeed, in February in the main chamber, I was able to highlight to the Minister during the debate on the roadmap to education, the work of the Education Minister and Northern Ireland Executive in providing funding for summer schools throughout the province to help children to catch up if needed. It is a default matter, but it was a, such a good scheme, uh, and I wanted to mention that and, and give the minister some credit here in Northern Ireland. The idea is that there will be funding for schools to run summer programmes of two to three weeks with children who have fallen behind. Teachers can also choose to run the classes, or they can liaise with substitute teachers to provide the additional help, which would also allow those who depend on substituting to earn their money and help fill the breach with education for children. It is clear to me uh, Mr Chairman, that COVID has had a massive impact on education and I fully support the need to get children back to school as soon as it is safe to do so. Uh, just today, the Minister in Northern Ireland has, has uh, uh, noted a, a timetable for children and their sporting activities to return to normal. And I think that's something that I know the Prime Minister and the government here centrally at Westminster has been working towards as well, indeed all of the devolved administrations. For some parents, Homeschooling has been simply unworkable due to work issues, internet connectivity or other concerns, and their children need additional support to pull them through. I know that sometimes the, the grandparents uh, are, feel under incredible pressure, uh, and I met some of them, and, and, and they just could not wait to, to, to get the, the, the grandchildren back to school, back to a normality, back to a routine. I suppose for grandparents of have reared their children, and uh, I've often said this, Mr. Chairman, probably applies to yourself as well, where uh, you, you're very, it's great being a grandparent because at seven o'clock you can get them back. But if they're living with you, they're schooling with you, then that opportunity is not there. 
this programme uh, that I referred to, the homeschooling and, and the internet co connectivity programme was run in some schools last summer and was incredibly successful. And I thank the Minister for making this possible again this summer. It's imperative that we do all we can to help children achieve their potential despite this last dreadful year. And summer schools are, I believe, a step forward in doing just that. And as further uh, noted that the Minister of Education put aside £5 million, especially for school, to determine how they can provide mental health support for pupils or staff as necessary. This could be in the form of outdoor equipment or individual counselling. It is my belief that there must be replicated UK-wide as long uh, as along with the elderly or young people's mental health has suffered and needs dedicated support. I don't think there's a debate on COVID-19, Mr Chairman, that we don't speak about the, the, the detrimental mental health uh, conditions of, of our children uh, of all ages, even at primary school age, uh, and uh, especially of, of, of um, secondary and college age as well. I've heard of so many young children in Northern Ireland are allowed to return to school that have been so joyful since they were allowed back in. But on the other hand, I've also had some parents, indeed several parents, telling me how, how starting their P1 back to school has been a nightmare with children screaming and hanging on to the street lights, unwilling or unable or, or, or uh, not wanting to go to school. Their small and wee minds are so full of fear and confusion that it's clear this is not just the little ones who are suffering. I've also heard parents talk about how their 14 year olds have anxiety about returning to school. The routine, which is essential for stability, has been turned around and they're finding themselves on very shaky ground. We need to take steps to steady that ground for them and invest in additional pastoral care, outdoor equipment, or even when safety measures allow, trips to rebuild bonds and confidence. And I think that's absolutely critical. I truly believe that only time will tell of the impact of lockdown and the fear that is brought on our vulnerable children. And we must be prepared to help effectively and swiftly when teachers pick up on those issues and problems. And they must have access to professional help for that child. We have lost so much so many, and we cannot afford to lose the new generation to fear and anxiety. We have long been clear that it's the desire of my party, a Democratic Unionist Party, and many others to see that the children brought safely back to school, and particularly with Northern Ireland's hugely successful vaccination programme, having vaccinated the most vulnerable with one vaccine, given a good level of protection, that the opening of schools is in a different position than ever before. Uh, today, Mr Chairman, I've just got my first vaccination. Uh, um, uh, for COVID-19, uh, and, and it was a painless, uh, almost painless, I have to say, operation, but I was very pleased to get that, and I must pay some credit to the staff and the volunteers who made um, the conveyor belt of vaccination so very, very easy to endure and thank them for it. I do believe, Mr Chairman, we can open schools and still protect our vulnerable, as well as improve education outcomes and address mental health concerns in our young people. That's an absolute uh, priority for me. I believe it's a priority for government as well. We must look to allowing team games and after schools clubs, for music, for dance, for theatre practices. All of these normal experiences that have been lost for an entire year by our young people. We must do what we can, I believe, to enhance their opportunities in school and after school and to the best of our ability. And we must trust God to restore mentally this year that the locusts have taken Education is a priority. We have all said it, we all know it, and we all believe it. Now we need to see that priority being action and also financed appropriately. Mr Chairman, thank you so much. Thank you. Jonathan Gullis. Thank, thank you very much, Mr Robinson. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship, and I'm delighted to be in what is an extremely important debate today about the future of education, particularly obviously and its impact with COVID. I feel like the Minister and I are seeing each other much more than our respective partners, having been a member of the Education Lit Committee and almost the weekly appearance that he makes before us. I'm delighted to once again be with him today. And I'm sure he'll hear some repeats of the moans and groans of our last uh, meeting at the Education Select Committee regarding this, because with reference to the petitions around GCC and A-levels, I appreciate the government was in a very tricky situation. I fully respect that the decision was made quicker than I think some would actually have uh, the, the public believe, but also laid out very clearly for pupils, parents and teachers what the process will be. And I must say that my inbox has not seen a deluge of emails, unlike the algorithm 
uh, debacle that we are, I'm sure, all keen to and, and desperate to forget. I would, however, like to stress, and the Minister will be aware of this, some of my concerns regarding when it comes to exam papers from, ex uh, from uh, exam boards, the fact that these are voluntarily and not mandatory when it comes to being taken. I'm aware that 100,000 people responded to the consultation and that students were very keen. The overall majority of students were keen for the tests to be something that was uh, voluntary. But actually teachers, even if it is, I think 41% of the Minister may have quoted the Education State Committee and I apologise if I've got that figure wrong. Uh, but still, the overwhelming majority of teachers did support, in my opinion, the fact that there should be some mandatory testing with these exam papers from exam boards and something I think would have been very helpful to the evidence base that would have gone and been given for. Because ultimately, the one thing that schools that I'm speaking to, particularly thinking about St Margaret's Ward Catholic Academy uh, in Stoke-on-Trent North, Kisgrove and Talk that I visited recently, where they said that there's now a very tight window in which to get assessments done. And where the angst is was the fact that the government announcement came, but yet it's a month until the guidance follows along with it. And that it has caused a lot of strain for teachers as they wonder what the exam boards will and will not allow, as well as obviously what they can and cannot do within this period of time. And particularly when we have a situation with testing, which I appreciate is difficult for the minister, but when kids are in school and they're getting a positive lateral flow test, and just, even if they go and go home and get a negative PCR test, they're not allowed back into school, which is seen in that particular school I mentioned, 38 year 11, stay away now for 10 days, which ultimately is going to have an impact on the evidence gathering that will need to take place. I would also have some issues and concerns around grade inflation and the impact on future years, and, uh, and actually grade suppression, which is something I really push at the Education Select Committee. Because ultimately with grade inflation, which has taken place, and we've seen this on quite a large scale, in fact, I believe uh, in the summer of 2020, with more generous than previous years, and to an unprecedented extent, at A-level, the proportion of candidates awarded an A-star or A went up 12.9 percentage points, and it from 25.2% in 2019 to 38.1% in 2020. And at GCSE, the proportion awarded grade 4 and above went up 8.8 .8 percentage points, from 67.1% to 75.9%. My worry is, as the Chair of the Education Select Committee regularly refers to, is that with this grade inflation will end up being baked into the system. And ultimately, there has to come a point where we draw a line in the sand here. And what I hope to hear from the Minister, if not today, in the future, is that when it comes to the 2020 cohort, that the grade inflation of the last two years will be ring-fenced and blacked out, as it were, as an anomaly because we're in a global pandemic, these unprecedented times, and we go back to 2019 pre-pandemic uh, summer grade inflation, summer grade inflation uh, results in order to have a better gauge on where students are actually at. But my issue with the suppression element is because ultimately there will be kids, particularly children from deprived backgrounds in Stoke-on-Trent, North Kids, Grevin Talk, who are well and above outperforming their school, uh, their peers in their schools, but also their school's historical um, performance. And what I do fear is that teachers, out of fear of having a mass investigation, will ultimately keep grades lower because they do not want other pupils potentially or the wider school to have been impacted in such a way by Ofqual coming in to investigate. So I do fear that there will be kids who don't get the grades they deserve, particularly those in deprived communities like the ones I'm proud to serve because of that very reason. But I will say this to the Minister, well done, because for the NEU to admit that they were wrong is a feat of excellence and something that I thoroughly enjoyed and almost, almost had printed and put on my wall. Uh, to celebrate, because the fact that they were uh, proud to admit that they were wrong on the fact that the testing wouldn't work, well, it has worked really well. I saw it firsthand, both with the um, local primary schools I visited, like Chatley, uh, sorry, Whitfield Valley Academy, but also St Margaret's, as I said, where they had year groups and uh, form groups coming down at a time, having the tests. It worked really smoothly. It's given confidence to staff. It's given confidence to students. It's meant that those who were asymptomatic are able to be home and therefore stopping any spread taking place. Uh, and as I say, I think that's a really positive thing. Another aspect would be the uh, national tutoring programme. Now, the Minister, again, is aware of my concerns with this because whilst I absolutely support the aims and whilst I fully support the Minister in the fact that Teach First and the Education Endowment Fund are very good providers and groups and they have my full backing, my concern when you run big central government-style intervention like this is does it really get 
to those kids who need it. And when I have a city with over 30% of students who are eligible for free school meals, I do wonder whether or not we're actually going to reach every single child who has a right and deserves to have that tuition and that support. And when I only hear that so far 125,000 out of 1.5 million kids have so far been reached, that does raise concerns. And I would like to pass on from Dominic McKenna, the head teacher at St Margaret's Walk Catholic Academy, to the Minister about Teach First, where he has emailed them, engaged with them, and simply had an email back saying, we'll get back to you, which I appreciate he will not think is good enough, and he would want that follow-up to take place, because ultimately he knows and understands the pressures that head teachers are under. But also, when he did hear back on the one occasion and was asking for maths and English tutors, he was told that they were not available, but did he want modern foreign languages, which is still important. But if a school is asking for something and it's, the service isn't available, then it does raise questions about whether or not this national tutoring programme is going to work as well as it should do. And obviously, we're talking about two years, and I'm sure that members in this, uh, in this debate today will have concerns that what about those kids who are going to drop out uh, of education in the school setting, maybe going to colleges or apprenticeships, will they get the opportunity, if they missed out on this academic year, to catch up on anything that they had in, the previous, uh, in their following academic years, maybe in a different educational setting? That's my concern with the programme. Again, its aims are noble, its impact will be big. It's about whether or not we will actually get to every single child in those areas. So, uh, I there. But I will go on to talk about some of my other pet, my pet peeves that the Minister knows I'm, I'm a fan of, which is if we're going to really sort out education, I really do believe that we need a standardised test from reception up through to Year 11 uh, for all year groups in every school, a test that is a nationally written test. Everyone does the same. At primary, it will be literacy and numeracy. At secondary, English, math and science. So we have some actual data to see what the full loss of learning is that will impact and help schools understand what they need to do to help their students catch up ultimately in the longer term because I do believe that actually a lot of kids will catch up much quicker than we, uh, than we think. Children are remarkably resilient and I know this having been a head of year that's balding I've seen on these screens here the, the back of the headshot which was quite concerning the baldingness that's going on the back which kids I would like to think have accelerated as well as the receding hairline that my father at 65 has I've managed to achieve at 31. So ultimately I do believe that kids are remarkably resilient and I do think mental health again Children just being back in a school setting, back in with routine, back amongst their peers and their friends, back as well with their teachers who they do trust and respect, I think will go a long way to rebalancing uh, children overall and we'll see mental health support need to go to where it is most needed. So I do think that there's a huge pot of money in the sugar tax. I know we put it into school sports. I think mental health and camps is exactly where that money should be going particularly in the short term, but maybe have a look along at that in the longer term, because there is going to be some mental health challenges. It doesn't necessarily mean that every child needs one-to-one -one support, but, it's certainly, but that money that in the sugar tax can certainly unlock maybe some small group, work, small group work that would be really positive. And that standardised test, as I say, is really important. I also um, would talk about, and I think the Honourable Member for Mansfield, who I think is a fine speaker on these issues on education, talked about sports facilities, but also the use of the school building. These buildings are huge community assets, yet in the summer we see the gates closed and unless the school is able to lease out or rent out any of their space, they go unused. And I think that's a crying shame and we should be doing so much more with schools in the, uh, in the local area and using them, particularly as part of the summer catch-up programme and beyond, in order to allow youth groups and external agencies to save themselves overhead costs of their own buildings and actually get into find funding revenue streams for those kids as well. And my final plug would be for the Challenger Trust, which is uh, uh, CEO is Charlie Rigby, and I will declare an interest. I was actually formerly a councillor for him back in 2011 in the uh, ward of Shipson on Stour a long time ago. Um, but ultimately, the Challenger Trust does amazing work in Gateshead and Birmingham. Uh, it actually costs one seventeenth of the National Citizenship Service. It costs one seventh of on-site zones. And what they do is that rather than directly run programmes, they work with local partnerships to support school leaders to choose programmes that have the maximum amount of impact in extracurricular. And they're taking children out of their schools, out of their local area, to experience the things that people like me who went to a private school were able and privileged enough to be able to receive. And I want every child in every part of this country to be able to access those same opportunities to extracurricular, which can only be achieved if we find more sustainable, longer-term funding solutions. And whilst the NCS is an admirable project, it is something that is very much a short-term 
uh, project with the summer and again tends to attract in my opinion a lot of the middle and upper class children and not get into those deprived communities that desperately deserve it. So I think that uh, overall I, I think the, the petitioners, bless them, have done some really good work here. Obviously the government's well and truly answered those questions well in advance and uh, all I can say is that the teaching profession is an amazing profession, something that I love being part of for eight years. But I do feel that the teaching profession has been damaged reputationally, not by any fault of teachers, but I do think that the Department for Education does need to bear some responsibility over the fact that it hasn't always communicated in a timely and fashionable man manner, which has put school leaders in a very difficult situation and meant that they're getting out messages last minute, sometimes mixed messages, which causes di uh, uh, difficulty with parents. But I will say that my biggest criticism is the National Education Union, who I think have been an absolute disgrace throughout this crisis, to be quite frank. They've been more interested in playing petty party politics than involving uh, getting schools reopening and actually helping the people they're meant to serve, which are children and teachers, all of whom wanted to be back in school. Dr Mary Balstead, and obviously on 180,000 plus a year, Dr Kevin Courtney on over 200,000 pounds plus a year, well above what the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom earns. I've said it on my social media, I've said it on radio interviews with talk radio, and I will say it in this Westminster Hall debate, so it's a matter of record for Hansa. They must resign with immediate effect. They have failed the teaching profession. They have failed the children that those teachers are serving. They have damaged the reputation of the profession and led to this impression that teachers somehow went missing in this crisis and that couldn't be further from the truth. Thank you, Mr. Robertson. West Street. Thank you, Mr. Robertson. It's a pleasure to serve with you in the chair, and it's, it's great to be back in... Um, a Westminster Hall debate, even if we're not back in Westminster Hall. Um, these are great opportunities, not just to um, discuss in a, a usually a more coll a collegial and convivial way some of the big challenges facing our country. It's also a way, as we're seeing now, uh, for members of the public to get their voice heard and their concerns raised on issues that concern them. Clearly, lots of uh, water has gone under the bridge since these petitions reached the threshold for debate. Um, and some of the issues that I'll just touch briefly upon before focusing my remarks mainly on exams will be familiar to, to members right across the House. But with respect to the people who've signed the petitions, I, I will repeat them nonetheless for, for the benefit of, of the petitioners. Um, obviously, lots of people uh, were concerned about the safety of schools and the safe opening of schools. And we saw um, through a number of petitions, not least these, uh, a clamour for schools to be closed. I have to say, uh, particularly in light of ex the lived experience of children and young people during the course of lockdown, that closing schools ought to be the very last resort yeah, and the yeah, last yeah. to close and the first to reopen because we know that any time out of school, let alone the significant time out of school that children and young people have, can have a detrimental impact both in terms of learning and in terms of their mental health and well-being. And despite the best efforts of schools to keep children learning from home, we know that nonetheless for some children from certain backgrounds and with certain challenges have faced uh, a much more difficult time in accessing online learning, not least because uh, even as schools returned last week, the Department for Education was just about scraping in with its own target of getting laptops and devices out to children and young people. Tens of thousands of stu children still without the devices that they needed and hundreds of thousands of children receiving the devices far later than they really should have. Uh, nonetheless, there have been some concerns about safety in the classroom, both from children and young people and from staff working in schools. Uh, we believe that the government really should have done a lot more a lot sooner on that front. Um, I'm delighted to see mass testing being rolled out and hope that it continues to be a success in the way we've heard described in the debate this evening. Indeed, we'd called for mass testing to be rolled out uh, late, you know, into last year, so uh, it's disappointing that it only you know, took to, to this particular point in 2021 for mass testing to be rolled out. We also think the government missed a significant opportunity to vaccinate all school staff during the half term. Uh, President Biden's administration is currently in the process of vaccinating teachers uh, and one of the reasons we were pushing for that wasn't simply on the grounds of, of safety uh, but actually because uh, I think as we're already beginning to see 
there is still a challenge of keeping children in school learning. And one of the biggest challenges that the, the head teachers had, particularly when schools returned in September, was the issue of staff shortages uh, with the teachers going off sick themselves. So uh, we do think that the government ought to have vaccinated all staff, and we regret that that hasn't happened. And I'm afraid to say that we still see um, too many examples of schools being shortchanged when it comes to safety measures. Indeed, I've had schools in my own constituency write to me because the funding they've shelled out for PPE and other safety measures is not being re re reimbursed from the Department for Education. And what does that mean? It means head teachers robbing Peter to pay Paul, taking areas, taking funding from one area of the school budget and putting it into these extraordinary safety measures. And I think that's a source of deep regret. I certainly give point. Thank you very much. I'm grateful to Honourable Jennifer for giving way. And I would just say and, and agree with him on the point that the schools who were in sound financial uh, places pre the pandemic have been the ones hit hardest when it comes to the financial support they've received, which has been very little and meant that a lot of these schools have now ended up eating into their reserves uh, and obviously their positive bank balances. So does he agree with me that those schools in particular who will now be judged by Ofsted and potentially could uh, receive an inadequate uh, rating for their handling of finances do need to be really reimbursed and it's after, particularly when cleaning costs in some schools are up to £4,000 a month. I, I, I strongly agree with the, with the Honourable Gentleman and you know, the fact that these concerns are being expressed across parties should tell the Minister that there is a problem here that still needs to be uh, ad addressed and the point is these are extraordinary costs, these are one-off costs and I want to see every penny of schools' budgets being directed to learning and teaching and providing the support that pupils need, not least given the disruptions to their education over the last year. And it's regrettable if head teachers are having to uh, raid budgets that would normally be going towards pupils' education in order to fund uh, safety measures. Uh, and, and I hope that's a point the Minister will take away and re reconsider. Um, I do want to turn and address the points about um, exams. Uh, before I do, though, and, and so, um, I'm afraid I'm going to have to start disagreeing with the um, member for, for Stoke-on-Trent at this point, because um, you know, he made a, a number of, sort of quite um, partisan attacks on the National Education Union in his remarks. And look, I, I don't think this is actually very helpful. I think it, we're in the, in the middle of a national crisis. And education unions, whether they're representing teaching staff or support staff or staff in leadership positions, have a responsibility to speak up for the concerns of their members. And I have to say, whether it's the National Education Union or ASCO or the National Association of Head Teachers or NASUWT or indeed uh, Community um, and, and their voice section, uh, Unite, Unison, GMB, all of whom who represent staff in schools, I think they have actually, in a, um, in a responsible way, tried to convey the concerns of their members in a way that we as policymakers uh, you know, should, should pay attention to. That doesn't mean we always agree with them, and indeed there have been points during the pandemic where we haven't been on the same page as the National Education Union. Indeed, there have been points during the pandemic where the unions haven't been on the same page as each other. That's the nature of representative uh, tr trade unions uh, representing the concerns of, of their members. Uh, but I, actually, I, I think that given the extraordinary challenges that we've seen and given the level of stress and anxiety faced by staff themselves, I think what we've had from the education unions during the pandemic has been measured, sometimes robust, but nonetheless measured reflections of, of their members' concerns. And I, I don't think it's helpful to attack them in the, in the way that we've just seen. Uh, I do want to turn now to this issue of uh, exams and, and what needs to be done. Uh, I think the overarching message is that we've, the Minister and the Department have got to learn lessons from the mistakes they've been making throughout the pandemic. First and foremost, we want to avoid a repeat of last year's shambles. The Government's grading algorithm was an unmitigated disaster. About 40% of teacher A-level predictions in England were downgraded by the algorithm. Pupils from working class backgrounds were more likely to have seen a bigger downward adjustment from the algorithms than those from more affluent backgrounds. And the attainment gap between pupils on free school meals and those who weren't got significantly higher in terms of the number of A grades received. And there's something to learn about that whole miserable experience in terms of how the Education Secretary himself handled it, putting alternatives to the algorithm in place at just the very last minute, announcing that the system would be switched to a triple lock before Ofqual had signed it off, 
Indeed, Ofqual were only told about the plan on August 11th, two days before results day. Talk about lastminute.com. Uh, through his triple lock, the education secretary said students could use a valid mock, but he didn't direct Ofqual to consider what might constitute a valid mock until results day itself. Again, you know, not just last minute, after the event. And only after several days of chaos did the Education Secretary relent and revert to using unstandardised centre-assessed grades. Having had that awful experience and put young people and their teachers through uh, real uh, sort of chaos and anxiety uh, after A-level results day, the government's been slow again to plan for this year's exams, even after last year's shambles. It wasn't until October last year that the government announced a three-week delay for exams in 2021. We said then that government ought to have a plan B in place just in case exams couldn't take place and if the spread of the virus was such that exams as usual couldn't happen. But the government didn't act. Even when the government cancelled exams in January, it still didn't have a plan B. Uh, this, this should have been done months before, as we'd called for. Um, the BTEC fiasco, uh, you know, we, we had a, just an appalling situation where even as the Education Secretary announced all schools were to close at the beginning of January, having just summoned millions of children back into school for the day, he caused additional stress and confusion by insisting that BTEC exams to be taken that month, indeed some that week, ought to go ahead. Do you want to give away? Uh, I will give away. I'm very grateful to Donald James for giving way. And with regards to BTECs, would he not agree, though, that even though students were brought in for those exams they actually were for courses and subjects which exams are required to have been taken in order for them to get the qualification therefore give the confidence to employers that they have the necessary skills uh, in order to carry out their duties which they legally have to do rather than just uh, maybe something like English or maths which obviously is a very different thing altogether. Restricting. The problem though with, with, the, with the BTEC handling back in January was that the department was saying two things at the same time. They were saying these BTEC exams were going ahead, but then following an outcry and concerns about whether or not it would be safe, uh, they said that um, in light of evolving, and I'm quoting now, DfE statement, in light of the evolving public health measures, schools and colleges continue, can continue with the vocational and technical exams that are due to take place in January, where they judge it is right to do so. So it just added to the confusion and chaos. It wasn't just pupils sat at home trying to prepare for exams that were taking place literally the next day or in the coming days. It was their teachers also unable to give clear answers. It goes back to the point the Honourable Gentleman from Stoke raised about the, the, the invidious position that school leaders and teachers have been put in by the chaos and confusion, the different de de delay that's come out of the DfE, because they weren't clear on what was going on, the communication was poor for them, and so the very people who usually students are looking to to provide clear answers and strong advice and leadership simply weren't able to provide it, and through no fault of their own. This left us in the absurd situation where, according to the Education Secretary, about a third of colleges chose to continue with exams in January, while the rest did not. He then backtracked and cancelled BTEC exams in February and March. And again, while, while eventually he got to the right decision, why did he not see it coming? And why could he not take decisive action uh, in a way that told all students and all staff exactly where they stood and what he planned to do about it? Um, turning um, now to uh, some of the other challenges that are facing us ahead of um, you know, assessments this summer, um, the first is on, on private candidates. There's been this concern uh, throughout uh, the changes to examinations that uh, around 20,000 private candidates not affiliated with schools and colleges this year will be disadvantaged. Many students have been told they have to pay hundreds or even thousands of pounds for local exam centres and schools to assess them. And schools don't necessarily have the resources to do this. And again, for the benefit of people watching more, more than the people in, in the chamber, Private, we're not talking about privately educated students, we're talking about private candidates who are entering themselves privately for um, ex examinations. Uh, and many of these private candidates are students who weren't happy with their centre assessed grades last year. They feel they're being denied the opportunity to take exams and prove that they deserve uh, better grades. They're, we're worried about whether they're even going to get a sense to take them on. Now, I acknowledge that today there's been an announcement from the department on private candidates whereby schools will receive a subsidy for every private candidate that is entered. I think that will go some way, actually, 
to incentivising uh, centres to take these students on. Uh, I, I am concerned that in a, a very small number of, of subjects, but nonetheless there are a number of subjects, the fees to enter students to these exams is more than the £200 I think the department's offering, and I wonder if the Minister could speak to, um, speak to that point in particular. Uh, but I, I wonder what consideration, because this is the question we're getting from students, what consideration the department and Ofqual gave to allowing students to sit some private candidates to sit some form of exams because he will understand the concern of these students is that a system that relies on teacher assessment will be inherently disadvantageous or perhaps practically impossible if the centre doesn't have a relationship with the private candidates. Uh, so and th these are just some of the some of the quotes that I've got from, from some of the private candidates who've been expressing their concerns. One, one told Politics Home, with the promise of 2021 exams, I, hope, I was hopeful I could redeem myself in my other two A-levels. It's clear that the government thinks of us as afterthoughts. We're not going to just sit back while they toy with our future. We want a solution that works for everybody. Another student who was downgraded last year said, I decided to put my life on hold for another year and resit my exams this summer as the university kindly reinstated my offer. I made the decision not to give up on my dreams and not to settle for a grade I strongly believe was too low. I put an extreme amount of effort into revising every day so I'm able to move on. I, I'm absolutely devastated for, for private and reset candidates that exams have been cancelled again this year as they are, in the vast majority of cases, not able to get a teacher um, assigned grade. So I, I wonder if the Minister could explain, particularly for those students, what the practical challenges have been in terms of those students being able to sit an exam. And, and, and what reassurance he can provide that they will be able to sign up with um, another school or college and, and an assessment centre and receive um, a properly validated um, grade that reflects their, their abilities and their efforts in a way that they, they hope as, as students who are resitting. Um, the final point I want to make about this year's exams is the immense pressure that we're already beginning to see inflicted on teachers and head teachers as a result of the system for appeals that seems to have been outlined in the, um, in, in the, in the guidance. Um, one of my own secondary schools um, wrote to me quoting the guidance which says to reduce, reduce the number of errors made and in turn the volumes of appeals, centres will be expected to tell their students the evidence on which their grades will be based before the grades are submitted to exam boards. This will allow issues associated with, for example, absence, illness or reasonable adjustments to be identified and resolved before grades are submitted. Now, I think there's uh, something to commend in the approach that says students must understand the basis upon which they're being judged. Of course, that's absolutely right. It's also absolutely right that mitigating factors ought to be taken into account, and that should be done in a transparent way. What I think we're all concerned about is the implication here uh, that pupils will be able to, in particular, picking up on reasonable adjustments, either they or pushy parents with sharp elbows will be in effectively demanding to teachers and head teachers different grades than the one that the teacher is judged to be right. I think this puts schools in a really invidious position. And by the way, it should be regarded as a gentle warning to those who regularly make demands for a whole series of exams to be scrapped, that the grass is not always greener on the other side. And when you leave a system entirely to teacher judgment, not to say that it can't play a role, but when you leave it significantly to teacher judgment in the way that it has, I think it puts enormous pressure on teachers. And my concern is that it will also bake in deeper disadvantage because sharp elbowed middle class parents will be in there demanding uh, adjustments to grades and other parents will not. And uh, I wonder what the minister might say in response to that in terms of, um, in terms of uh, the approach to the, this year's exams. Finally, turning to next year's exams, if the education secretary hasn't learned from the absolute fiasco last summer and hasn't learned from the absolute fiasco we saw in January, or the completely last minute way in which he made a decision about exams in 2021. Please, for the love of God, I hope he's made uh, uh, some um, judgments about exams in 2022, because we already have students, GCSE, A-level and BTECs, already on their courses 
expecting to sit exams in 2022. And there is simply no good reason why the Department for Education and Ofqual should not be able to tell those students what exams in 2022 would look like. Indeed, the acting Ofqual Chief Regulator Simon Liebus told the Education Select Committee last week, and I quote, so as far as 2022 is concerned, the thinking at the moment is about adaptations along the lines that had been originally contemplated for this year when exams were still to go ahead. Indeed, the Minister himself said, and I quote, we are working now on what decisions we will take for 2022 because we know there's been disruption, but we will have more to say on that later in the year. I'm afraid later in the year really isn't good enough. And it's, it's really inexplicable when these issues and the, the fact that the choices uh, available to exam boards and to ministers about mitigations and adjustments to exams, these are well known. They were debated and discussed ahead of exams uh, potentially taking place in 2021. So why aren't these decisions ready to go? Why aren't we providing clarity and certainty to schools, to teachers and students who are crying out for it? There, there is simply... I just find it unfathomable that we're not providing clear instruction and clear guidance to students who are on these courses right now, wondering what they should be studying for and towards, and wondering what their exams would look like. And of course, adjustments are necessary. Uh, looking at the, um, the department's own data, we estimated that year 10 pupils have missed one in eight days of GCSE teaching. Now, it may not be quite so severe at A-level because we always expect a greater degree of independent learning, but there would nonetheless be some, some degree of learning loss. And for students from the most disadvantaged backgrounds, we know that the challenges they, that they face will be greater. Last week, I met with school leaders from UM6 forms, and um, both, um, both, both of the principals present were very, very clear um, that there's scant information coming from government and that they need certainty now. Uncertainty is piling, pressure, uh, is piling on the pressure facing pupils and their teachers. The longer ministers dither and delay, the harder it will be to make meaningful adjustments for exams to go ahead in a way that is fair to all pupils. Ministers need to learn from their mistakes and act sooner rather than later. And you know, if the Education Secretary didn't feel battered and bruised from his previous encounters with exams and motivated to do something different and something earlier and something decisive, there really is no hope for him. We need to leave a couple of minutes for Mr Hunt to wind up. Minister. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure uh, to serve under your chairmanship once again, uh, Mr Robertson. Um, can I congratulate my honourable friend, the member for Ipswich, on the way he opened uh, this debate? And I'm sure my honourable friend will join me uh, in recognising the enormous professionalism uh, and commitments of school staff uh, working in our schools uh, and working with their students throughout the lockdown to continue their education and progress towards assessments, whether students are being taught on site or remotely. Today we're debating four petitions, and it's worth noting that the context, of course, has changed significantly since those petitions were first submitted. There are uh, two are about uh, school reopening for the majority of pupils and students. One requests a delay uh, to full opening until May, uh, and the other requests that schools uh, in previous uh, Tier 4 areas remain closed to the majority of pupils. Secondly, we have uh, two petitions focusing on exams. One requests that BTECs be assessed by teacher-predicted grades. The other requests a cancellation of the 2021 GTC and A-level exams. And finally, I want to outline our education recovery plans to demonstrate the further work that's being developed to help pupils and students recover any lost learning. Now, my honourable friend, the member for Ipswich, is right that we do need to be cautious about overgeneralising about how children have fared during lockdown. He's also right to raise the issue of special educational needs and the uh, the, input of, uh, the impact of COVID uh, on the most vulnerable children. And special schools, of course, have mostly been open uh, to their pupils during the period of lockdown. And we have consistently prioritised uh, specialist settings in our recovery premiums. Both special schools and AP uh, will be funded to provide summer schools and the National Tutoring Programme. And we've also announced a £42 million package of continued support for children with SEND and their families uh, during this difficult period. Now, both my uh, honourable friends, the member for Ipswich and the, my honourable friend, the member for Mansfield, uh, raised the issue of, of pupil mental health. Now, we know that the pandemic is impacting children's mental health, 
uh, and that time out of school for most pupils will have limited their social interaction. And that's why the government is continuing to prioritise mental health and wellbeing support for children uh, and staff as they return to school. Uh, and the department has convened a mental health in education action group to consider how to support children and young people's mental health as they return to school. And this will build on the support uh, provided through the Wellbeing for Education Return uh, training uh, programme. Now, the Honourable Member for uh, Richmond Park asked about uh, face coverings. Now, we published a summary of the evidence uh, as schools opened, and it's one more measure in the system of controls designed uh, to reduce the risk of transmission uh, of the virus. SAGE has advised that face coverings can be effective uh, in reducing transmission in uh, public and community settings, and their effectiveness stems mostly from reducing the emission of virus-carrying particles when worn by an infected person. Now, though I know that uh, some uh, have been anxious, uh, Mr Robertson, uh, about the return to school from the 8th of March, returning to face-to-face -face education in schools and colleges is a national priority. And the return to school last week has been a huge success, uh, as my honourable friend, the member for Stoke North, uh, celebrated in his remarks. We owe a huge debt of gratitude uh, to the teachers uh, and to the support staff who have worked so hard in preparing uh, schools as well as providing remote education while most pupils were at home. And I saw firsthand uh, on the Friday before the schools opened on March the 8th, a school in Portsmouth preparing for that return preparing and getting children tested even in the week before schools opened in a very systematic and organised way. And on Monday I visited a primary school uh, in uh, Streatham and saw the joy on the children's faces as they returned to school and to be with their friends. There is clear evidence that time out of education can be detrimental to children's future prospects and earning potential, with implications also for long-term productivity for the economy. By February half term, the Institute for Fiscal Studies reported that the total loss in face-to-face -face education time was half a normal school year for children right across the UK. And despite huge efforts across industry and the government to ensure that all pupils have had appropriate technology for remote teaching, such as the 1.2 million laptops and tablets that have been delivered to date to schools, trusts and local authorities, pupils from of the most disadvantaged backgrounds were disproportionately affected by the lack of digital equipment and study space to participate always effectively. Now, younger pupils have also found it more uh, challenging to engage in remote education. Schools, uh, teachers and parents have worked tirelessly to continue uh, the education of their pupils and students, but there is no substitute for time with a qualified teacher. Now, the negative effects are also likely to extend beyond educational attainment, with NHS research suggesting one in six young people may now have a mental health problem, up from one in nine uh, in 2017. Now, the success of the vaccination uh, rollout, uh, Mr Robertson, 24 million people in this country have been uh, vaccinated, and as Sam Friedman has pointed out, in countries of over 10 million people, we are the world's leader by a margin in, a, in having such a successful rollout of the vaccination programme. It does mean that infections and hospitalisations are falling and it's paving the way for the safe and gradual lifting of restrictions. And we're also heading into the spring when we would expect prevalence of respiratory diseases to fall, although restrictions on attendance in schools have been removed. Other restrictions remain in place to ensure that transmission rates remain low uh, across the country. And it is hugely important, of course, that all of us continue to obey uh, those uh, restrictions. In addition, schools will continue to implement protective measures as set out in the system of controls. Regular testing of children further reduces the risk of transmission in schools. And in relation to remaining uh, open in areas that were previously categorised as Tier 4, as is one, in one of the petitions, I would note that we are seeing significant decreases uh, in cases across almost all parts of the country and across all age groups. And in the absence of significant regional disparity, the government decided to ease restrictions at the same time across the whole of England. And due to the current relatively uniform spread of the virus across the country, the four steps out of lockdown set out the roadmap, set out in the roadmap, are designed 
to apply to all regions. But we have been clear that the return is dependent on the data against the four tests as set out in the roadmap. Uh, and the roadmap therefore sets out indicative no earlier than dates for the steps which are five weeks apart. And these dates are wholly contingent on the data and are subject to change if those four tests are not met. Now, turning to exams, uh, Mr Robertson, we, we did not uh, want to cancel exams in either 2020 or 2021. We believe exams are the best and fairest form of assessment uh, for students to show what they know and can do. And it was only in the unprecedented circumstances of the outbreak of COVID that we had to make the very difficult decision to cancel exams as part of the wider measures to protect public health. This year, under different circumstances, the decision that exams could no longer go ahead as planned was made to ensure fairness among an exam cohort who had received differing amounts of face-to-face -face education, given <clears throat> a further disruption to student education uh, in January, and the very varying need to self-isolate in different parts of the country during the autumn term. This summer, we will trust teachers' professional judgment to award grades based on a range of evidence. We have been working on the contingency for exams being cancelled during the autumn term, which is why Ofqual and the DfE were able to consult on the details of the alternative to exams on the 15th of January, just 11 days after the announcement of the lockdown. Ofqual uh, launched a joint consultation with the DfE on the 15th of January with details of how grades would be awarded um, the, uh, the, uh, the quality assurance approaches that we would be taking and details of the appeals process. We received over 100,000 responses to the consultation, over half of, whom, of which were from students. Students will now receive grades determined by their teachers with assessments covering what they were taught and not what they missed. And teachers have a good understanding of their students' performance and how they compare to other students this year and in previous years. And we've given teachers the flexibility to use a range of evidence, including the use of optional questions by uh, exam boards, uh, 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 mock exams, non-exam assessment or co coursework and in-class tests. And both my honourable friend, the member for Ipswich, and my honourable friend, the member for Stoke North, asked for the exam material to be mandatory, a mandatory part of that range of evidence that teachers use to support the grade that they submit. Well, we asked that question uh, in the consultation about whether these materials should be compulsory. Uh, and overwhelmingly, the, uh, the optionality option uh, was the response. And as I said last week at the Select Committee, we didn't want to bring in a mini-exam by the back door, having just cancelled exams because they weren't going to be a fair way of assessing uh, people's qualifications. Now, we want teachers to feel supported while making their decisions, and we'll be providing guidance to enable them to make assessments and, uh, fairly and consistently. There will be internal and external quality assurance processes to identify errors and make consistent judgments, and to support students who believe their final grade is wrong, there will be a right to appeal that grade. We also want to be fair uh, to all students, regardless of the type of qualification that they're taking. We announced on the 25th of February the arrangements for awarding qualifications this summer for VTQs that are similar to GCSEs and, and A-levels and use the progression to further or higher education. It's not viable for external exams for these qualifications to go ahead. Instead, results will be awarded through similar arrangements to GCSEs and A-levels uh, with teacher-assessed grades. Many BTECs will therefore be receiving teacher-assessed grades as well. Functional skills qualifications are un unlike GCSEs and uh, vocational technical qualifications uh, in their qualification and assessment structure. They're taken by a wide range of pupils uh, and students, including adults. Uh, and some BTQs are much smaller than GCSEs and, be and can be taken on demand uh, when the students are ready. Therefore, all efforts should be made to allow pupils and students to take an assessment in line with public health measures or remotely, and where this is not possible, then teacher assessed grades for awarding will be made available. And where students are taking uh, vocational qualifications to enter directly into employment, uh, and technical competence needs to be demonstrated, exams and assessments will continue in line with public health measures. This is so that students can demonstrate the necessary occupational or professional standard that they need, so they can, be, uh, they can start uh, work in a safe way. 
Um, I think the Honourable Member raised the issue of private candidates. We are determined that uh, private candidates will be uh, able to receive a grade this year. We are capping fees that centres can charge and we are subsidising the extra costs that uh, schools will face in assembling the evidence to support that grade. JCQ will be publishing shortly a list of schools and colleges that will provide support to private candidates in being awarded a qualification. Now, Mr Robertson, we recognise that extended school and college restrictions have had a substantial impact on children and young people's education, and we're committed to helping pupils make up any education that has been lost as a result of the pandemic. No pupil should suffer their long-term prospects as a consequence of what's happened over the last year. In January 2021, the Prime Minister committed to working with parents, teachers and schools to develop a long-term plan to support schools uh, and pupils make up that lost education. And as part of this, we appointed Sir Kevin Collins as Education Recovery Commissioner in February to advise on the approach for education recovery and the development of a long-term plan to help pupils make up their education. And as an immediate step, we made available £1.7 billion in funding to support education recovery. And in June 2020, we announced a £1 billion as part of that £1.7 billion a catch-up package including a national tutoring programme and a catch-up premium for this academic year. And in February, we committed uh, to a further funding of £702 million to fund summer schools and expanding our uh, tutoring programme and to fund a recovery premium for next academic year. That's what, that £700 million then is part of the £1.7 billion. So we continue to learn and understand uh, what, uh, as, we, as we continue to learn and understand what more is needed to help students recover uh, lost education over the course of this uh, Parliament. Uh, and we will ensure that support is delivered in a way that works for both young people and uh, the sector. So in conclusion, uh, Mr Robertson, uh, the return to school on the 8th of March was rightly the first step uh, in our roadmap to recovery and has been successfully delivered with thanks to education staff across the country, uh, with primary attendance high and secondary uh, school attendance rising steadily throughout the week. And we'll continue to be led by the data in terms of each step on the roadmap and have contingencies in place uh, if any actions need to be taken in the event of extremely high prevalence of coronavirus over the coming months. GCSEs, AS levels and A levels have been cancelled in summer 2021 along with many BTECs and other uh, VTQs, with students instead being awarded grades based on assessment by the teachers. Education recovery is a firm focus of the Government, with the appointment of the Education Recovery Commissioner and the announcement of increased funding to enable a variety of activities to help with refreshing the academic and social lives of pupils and students. School and college staff have been asked to rapidly become IT experts health and safety experts, test facilitators and examiners this year. And I'd like to finish by once again thanking them wholeheartedly for all their work, their commitment and their professionalism. To wind up, Tom Hunt. Thank you very much. Um, it's still a pleasure to serve in your internship, as it was at the start. Um, and I'd like to thank very much to the Minister for his, his response, which I did think was um, um, comprehensive uh, and, and certainly addressed many of the points that, that I raised. I mean, we, we have got this problem with these petitions in as, in, 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 in as much as some of them in particular are, uh, there's been a lot of more time than bridge since then, but I think certainly the one, the petition on exams and uh, yeah. assessment, I think certainly that one has been um, dwelt on a, a, a lot by, dwelled on, dwelled on, dwelled on a lot by uh, different, um, uh, different um, honourable friends and honourable members. So I think hopefully they feel as though they, many of their concerns have been alleviated. I think it is, um, there is this issue about testing, about, and I, I appreciate that there was a consultation and the decision was made uh, for them, uh, for these tests to not be mandatory, but I just really do hope that, that means that um, any children who, who, who could actually really benefit from a test and, and, and don't feel as though their, their chance is being shut. And, and actually I really do hope that if if a child in question and all, that, and all their parents go to a teacher and say, look, we really do think our child can benefit from having the test, I hope that the teacher in question is responsive and listens. So that's what I would say there. I understand the reasons why it wasn't compulsory, but I do hope there is flexibility there. And I, think, and I hope teachers exercise flexibility as well and are sensitive to the fact that not all children are the same 
not all of them uh, you know, learn in the same way, and some of them benefit more than exams, for example. Uh, so that, 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 that you know, and I, I am encouraged by a lot of what I've heard from the Minister and also from the Recovery Commissioner when he came to the Education Select Committee about um, giving teachers the flexibility and really respecting that they know best often for their, for their children and that the individual child needs to be at the heart of all of this. In terms of the uh, teaching profession, um, you know, I think some of these issues around recruitment and retention, that were issues before the pandemic, are obviously even greater now. I have been encouraged by some of the stats I've seen, but have seen that actually the number of applications has gone up. I think in many senses, um, you know, we, we could say that the behaviour of certain unions hasn't helped. But in other, other respects, I think we've often seen, you know, teachers acting heroically in terms of the work yeah, that they yeah, put yeah, in yeah. to get their schools ready. And actually, I think, and certainly when I think about the the schools and the teachers in my own constituency, some of the work they've done to support people at their school beyond just the academic. I mentioned sort of Copleston High, High School in East Ips, which you set up a community pop-up shop to help, to help children at their, uh, at their school. And some of the work that they've done has been exceptional. Uh, so in some senses, I think the teaching profession in a way many people perceived it has gone up. But I think those issues around teaching recruitment and retention are obviously very important and need to be looked at. You know, I think that the, I mean, the government has, um, you know, being being a you know, education minister over the last year. I mean, I can't Im imagine how difficult it must have been. I mean, no government's been in this position before, and and of course, it is very easy to criticise. It's very easy to say, well, in hindsight, you should have done this, you should have done that. That isn't to say that the government haven't made mistakes. It isn't to say that on occasion they couldn't have been better with the commas. But it's just to say that I think it is important that we recognise the huge challenge of what it must be to be an education minister during this pandemic. When I talk to parents and when I talk to teachers, there have been occasions where I've had difficult conversations and they've criticised the government, they've criticised various things that have happened, January being one case, the algorithm being another. But I have to say, um, you know, in the last couple of weeks, I've had two conversations of two um, head teachers who've been incredibly complimentary about many of the things that have happened. We do, when you talk about the laptops getting out, you know, bearing in mind the scale of the operation and logistics, sadly, there will be examples where not all of that equipment gets to where it needs to be. But what I'd also say is that more often than not, it has. And I've spoken to head teachers in my constituency who have been incredibly grateful for that, including a head teacher for Stoke High School, which probably has the most deprived catchment in Ipswich, who, 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 who's, had over, who's had hundreds of, of, of equipment delivered, which have benefited children at that school. So that is something that I also think needs to be Recognise. I think that when we, uh, I, I know that there was a bit of a debate about the National Education Union, you know, and I, I have to say that, you know, I probably sympathise with my honourable friend and member Mr. Stoke and North's interpretation of that particular issue. Uh, and and, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I, I do, I do think, I do think that, you know, the, 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 I think that it's been an incredibly difficult situation for, for, for pupils, for teachers, for schools, for government. And I do think at various times, I think the, you know, the National Education Union could have acted in a much more constructive way. And I think, and I think but, but unfortunately it hasn't. And I think, and because of that, I think it's made a difficult situation even more difficult. And I do think it's been motivated by political point scoring to, to far too much. Uh, and I do, I do sometimes question if they had their way, whether their schools would have been open at all over the last year. They probably would have been closed and they'd still be closed now because, you know, when it comes to teacher, teachers being prioritised for a vaccine, um, I have to say I was sympathetic to the arguments, uh, particularly before it became clear the huge success that our vaccination programme is, because I just thought we just need to get the schools open. And in fact, if by doing that, that helps the situation, let's go down that route. So I, I, you know, publicly, I have, I have shown sympathy towards that view. And I had one school in my constituency approach me saying, look, logistically, we think we can do it. We think you know, we've got all the resources. If we can get the vaccine, we think we can vaccinate all teachers and teaching staff and Suffolk within two weeks. And I, and I was open to working with them. And, and what was really interesting is this all ended up in the um, mail on Sunday, this particular. Uh, and I had some, some quotes in there from the NEU totally dismissing this, totally dismissing this. So here's an example of you know, people in the education sector wanting to roll their sleeves up and say, right, let's do this, and just being shot down by the NEU, who effectively said that until all teaching staff get both doses, they need two doses, before, and, and so that was my interpretation of what they were saying, that, they, they, that they, if they had their way, there wouldn't be any schools open until every single yeah, member of teaching staff had two doses, which would, which, which, which would, how long would that take? So, but I think that... There has been anxiety from, um, from teachers within, within my constituency about the fact that they haven't been prioritised uh, for a vaccine. You know, 
you know, and, I've, and they, they've made it clear to me that, you know, heading up to the 8th of March, that was one of their key concerns. But I think each day, each week that goes by, and this remarkable progress that we are making as a country in terms of the number of people we are vaccinating, those concerns are being alleviated. Yeah. Because as we vaccinate more people now in their 50s, uh, 50s and then soon 40s, is that actually most of those teaching staff who, who, who would have been more vulnerable to a virus have now been vaccinated as part of a general process anyway. So I think that is to be recognised, and the fact that we're doing so much better than virtually any other country in the world. So, um, on the whole, I, I, I think that I think that consistency and clarity going forward, and particularly as um, the honourable member for uh, Ilford North has, has mentioned about next year's assessments, I think you know providing clarity and consistency as early as possible on that. I think what the, my honourable friend, the member for Stoke North, has said about a national test to really you know get a much better understanding of to what extent there's been late learning loss and for each child, because we cannot make assumptions about what their particular experience has been. Um, so I think we've got a huge challenge ahead of us, but I'm confident the government are very aware of that. And I hope that the petitioners who signed these petitions in some way, though perhaps not looking at this debate and thinking it's just a issue. issue. Yeah. Order the <laughs> sitting stands adjourned. Please will members leave the room promptly by the exit door on the left while observing social distancing. Thank you.